Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through The Lawyerist Lab. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. Hi, I'm Stephanie Everett. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 329 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. In today's episode, we're talking with law professors Michael Heller and James Selsman about the rules of ownership in our lives and what role lawyers play in all of this. Today's podcast is brought to you by Text Expander, Postali, and ESQ.Marketing. We wouldn't be able to do the show without their support, so stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. So we're super excited because our 2021 Best Law Firm website contest winners are now live and up on the website for you to check out. Yeah, the Best Law Firm websites contest is one we've run now for, I think, 12 years in a row where we try to identify the 10 best small law firm websites from around the country. And best, we have some specific definitions around it includes performance and technical aspects and design and our perception of performance for acquiring clients and telling potential clients about the law firm. And in addition to the contest results itself, which we absolutely encourage you to go on our website and check out, see if you get any great ideas, we outline some of the features we look for and things you could do to your own website to not just make it potentially worthy for a future one of our contests, but also just to follow some of our best practices that we look for in trying to identify the best sites in the country. Yeah. So I knew one of the winners this year and and I have nothing to do with the judging for what it's worth. So I reached out to her just to congratulate her. And I was like, you know, this is super exciting. And she wrote back and was like, wow, however many years ago when I went to design my website, I actually used this page and the tips and suggestions that you gave in thinking through and designing my website. So I thought that was super cool. Like someone actually took our advice and followed what we said. And then anecdotally that I think I have heard that from at least one winner every year for probably the last four or five years, since this has been out there long enough that we're now regularly getting people who are building their website around the recommendations we make. And then it turns out that many of them win. That's awesome. So I love that people can go there and not just get ideas for your website, but really get some practical tools, a tool that exists on our site that people might not know about, which is if you're actually looking to hire an agency to help you build out your website, you can actually head to our site and answer some questions. And based on the answers to those questions, what you're looking for, we can give you some recommendations of different providers who may be a good fit for you. We hired a software development team to build out a product recommendation tool. So it includes all of our expert insights built into a really quick three or four question questionnaire that algorithmically will smartly recommend to you the best um, marketing agency or website designer for your particular firm's needs. And it's free. And so people might not know, but you go to our website, lawyerist.com, and then you click at the top, you'll see product reviews. And then there's a drop down for marketing agencies and SEO services. So when you land on that page, you can read all about one, I think it's really useful how to think about even hiring an agency and what kind of questions you might want to ask and the features that they may offer and things you should think about. But then at the top of that page, you'll see the login is find a product match and you click on there and it takes you through that tool and then spits out the results. So we're super excited for you to try it out and let us know if that is a useful tool for you. Yeah. And now we have Laura's conversation with Michael and James. Hi, I'm Michael Heller. I'm a law professor at Columbia Law School in New York City and also the new vice dean. I teach and write about ownership, about who gets what and why. I'm Jim Salzman. I'm a professor of environmental law at the School of the Environment at the University of California, Santa Barbara, in the law school at UCLA, and I write about environmental issues and natural resources. 
Well, thank you both for joining us on the show. Definitely excited to chat with you about all your areas of expertise and in particular, your most recent book. Can you tell me a little bit about what inspired the book? So I uh, had written a popular book about drinking water back in 2012, and Michael had written a popular book called The Gridlock Economy about some problems that arise in ownership that make it very difficult to do things, to make progress. And he and I were both looking for another popular book to write. And I was talking with a friend of mine at a law professor's conference, and he just mentioned offhand, you know, it's funny that there's never been a Freakonomics for property, mm. Freakonomics for how we own things. And this sort of proverbial ding went off in my head, and I thought, you know, you're right. If you look at Freakonomics sort of as a structurally, it's just very clever stories teaching microeconomics. And what we try to do is to basically use very clever stories to give insights into the different ways that we own things. I like to think we go farther than free economics. We try to recast how to think about ownership more generally, but that was the origin. I knew Michael from his work and as a friend, and it turned out to be a great team. This is, I guess, seven years in since we started this. Awesome. Can you talk a little bit about your big picture perspective on issues of ownership today? Has it been the same way for a long time? Has this evolved as society has evolved? I know there's a lot of different elements to this, but what is sort of the big picture of issues of ownership as they play out in day-to-day life? Well, there, it turns out one of the things that we discovered is that there are just six simple stories that everyone uses to claim everything in the world. Um, And these are the same stories that you see in the Bible. And they're the same stories at the cutting edge of the digital economy today. Ownership has to be pretty simple if we're going to get through our day without killing each other. And ownership actually is pretty simple. So we use stories like, I had it first, first come, first served, or I'm holding on to it. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. And it turns out that these very simple, very organic, natural, perhaps even instinctive stories are the root through which everyone claims everything. And because we can use those stories, we can assert our claims for ownership against other people. Other people can use their stories to claim back against us. So ownership turns out to be a storytelling battle among a very small handful of very powerful claims to scarce resources. And I imagine that people have those different perspectives on those six simple stories. And that's maybe where some of the conflict emerges is when one person is seeing that their way is right and another person feels that their way is equally as right, but they are not on the same page of doing that. How do those issues sort of play out? You're absolutely right. And they play out, as Michael said, both the elemental and the epic. So think about a playground. You see two kids fighting over a plastic shovel. What we hear is mine, mine, mine. What's going on there was much more sophisticated. One of the kids is essentially arguing, I had it first, first come, first serve. Say, imagine he put the shovel down, turns around, another kid picks it up. The other kid is arguing current possession. Possession is nine tenths of the law. As Michael said, what we hear is mine versus mine is actually these two battling stories. But think about sort of as far as you could get from the playground, which is the virtual world, the internet, click streams. Who owns our click stream? There, the battling stories as well. You know, when you basically visit these apps, you go to a travel site, you're thinking about taking a trip to Springfield, Chicago, or whatever. And all of a sudden you find all these ads for Springfield restaurants, or Chicago hotels are trailing you everywhere you go. That's because your information on that travel website has been taken and then sold to advertisers. Right. Who owns your information? Could say self-ownership. It's part of me. It's part of who I am. That's one of the six stories. The website can say labor. We built this cool website we put the effort into it, we should reap what we've sown. So right there, you've got four of the basic stories. And the key point here, and Michael was talking about this earlier, there's no natural correct answer about who owns what. It's always up for grabs. It's always a storytelling battle. And you mention in your book that as these valued resources become scarcer, people are competing to impose their preferred ownership rule. And where this tends to play out is entrepreneurs finding ways to profit or just their influence in the market being so impactful. One of the things that jumped to mind for me as I was reading through that is all of the changes that Apple has made with regard to privacy that makes it harder to retarget people with Facebook ads. And Facebook is kind of saying, well, if they're using our platform, you know, We own that data and we want to be able to capture that through pixels and retarget people and hit them with ads and Apple saying, but we don't want our users to be exposed to unnecessary privacy risks. Can you talk a little bit about how this plays out with regard to the influence of entrepreneurship sort of capitalizing on these conflicts in ownership? Absolutely. So what you see today is that this is actually an ongoing battle, which is really right at the cutting edge of ownership, which is who owns our intimate lives online. Now it's possible 
to frame this. And in fact, many of the times we do frame this as questions of, about privacy, which is basically hands off my body or hands off my mm -hmm. personal data. But I think a more fruitful way to think about this is in terms of ownership. What framing our online lives in terms of privacy, which is keep out, which is what Apple is doing, basically says, let's us as consumers say, no, I don't want you to have my data. But what it doesn't do is say, yes, you can have this data if you pay me for it. So from an ownership perspective, what we are trying to think about here is what are ways to basically create markets that are win-win rather than win-lose? Win-win both for the Facebooks and the Apples and for us as consumers. If this is a market that we do want to participate in, uh, we should have the ability to do so on a fair footing that compensates us for the extremely valuable data that each of us provide as we click around on the internet. And using ownership design tools, this is something that lawyers are actually quite good at. This is one of the skills that lawyers have is as uh, basically transaction cost engineers, people are able to think about design of mechanisms that create value for clients and in particular create value for us as consumers, having a way to monetize something that currently we give away for free, which is our clickstream. We're going to pause to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors and we'll be right back. Support for today's broadcast comes from Text Expander. Work smarter, not harder with Text Expander. Text Expander helps you work faster and smarter so you can focus your time on your most important work. With just a few keystrokes, Text Expander keeps you consistent, accurate, and working efficiently. Speed through emails, expand forms with fill in the blank fields using a quick abbreviation. Use Text Expander's powerful shortcuts and abbreviations to streamline and speed up everything you type. Get your message right every time by expanding content that corrects your spelling and keeps your language consistent with a few keystrokes. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Just visit TextExpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more. Support for today's broadcast comes from Postali. Building the next powerhouse law firm takes hard work and an entrepreneurial spirit. But some skills escape even the savviest of attorneys. To reach new heights in your legal practice, you need a genuine marketing partner, one that tells you where you are now and where your firm could go. Postali works with law firms nationwide, and their trademarked marketing fiduciary services sets them apart from every other vendor that's cold calling or flooding your inbox. Whether it's informal guidance about things you can do today or a big picture approach to law firm expansion, Postali is perfect for business minded attorneys with an eye on the future. No matter where you are in your journey, Postali is the full service, strategic marketing partner that grows with your firm. To learn more about the services Postali offers, visit postali.com forward slash lawyerist and reach out for a free consultation. Support for today's episode comes from ESQ.marketing, an agency that provides successful SEO strategies for every stage of your practice. You will work with experts in legal marketing. All of their intense focus is on helping attorneys generate more clients and cases from the internet. They don't work with anyone else. You'll breathe easy with low-risk, month-to-month contracts. There are no long-term commitments. ESQ Marketing earns the right to work for your firm each and every month. Best of all, you'll get direct access to the person working on your account. No account managers to deal with. No lost in translation with your requests. To see if you're a fit, visit esq.marketing forward slash lawyerist to get started. So you talked a little bit about these different transaction costs, and I know one of the phrases that comes up in your work as well is this idea of ownership engineering. Can you explain a little bit more of what that looks like in real life? Absolutely. So it turns out that, as Michael said, there are a lot of different ways that we can own things. So for example, if you think about, and this is one of the things that was so surprising to us, it's really kind of our anchor story, when you're flying, there are fights that break out pretty frequently, it turns out, about whether you have a right to recline or not the so-called right to recline versus the knee defender. And people really go at it. And what they don't realize is that the problem is not the person in front of the person behind. The problem actually is the owner. It's the airline, because what the fight is over is control over this wedge of space right behind the seat. Who owns, who controls that wedge of space? And what the airline is doing is just selling that wedge of space twice on every flight. It's selling it to me to recline, and it's selling it to you to use as your workspace. And so what they do, there actually is a rule on most airlines. There is a right to recline, but they never tell you that, and they don't enforce it. And the reason for that is they basically push off through ownership engineering, through selling the same thing twice. They push off the conflict 
onto the passengers. And so the passengers are seen as the bad folks and not the airline itself. So this, just to amplify on that, for the airline example, the person who's reclining has a little button on the seat. So what they're saying is that reclining wedge of space is attached to my seat. Attachment <laughs> is one of the six simple stories everyone uses to claim everything. It's also the insight behind my home is my castle. The person behind says possession, nine-tenths of the law. I had that. I'm holding onto that space. And I was there first. First come, first serve. So what we have as passengers is this storytelling battle between us, but it's a battle that was created deliberately by the airlines for their profit, not for our comfort. So that's one of the tools of ownership engineering that the airline seat reveals, which is a very powerful tool that we call strategic ambiguity. Ownership is actually ambiguous much more often than people realize. And that ambiguity is quite a powerful tool, both for lawyers and for businesses. Jim and I have an article uh, recently in the Harvard Business Review that also may be of interest to some of your listeners entitled, Elon Musk Doesn't Care About Patents, Why mm -hmm. Should You? So this actually is something that's often a challenge for when we talk to a business audience is to have them realize that in many cases, law is overrated and lawyers will often push their clients towards legal solutions, towards having more law, more copyright, more patent, when actually in the business perspective, they're better off with ambiguity or in some cases, actually even tolerating theft of the product. I can give you that example as well. But this is an area where practicing lawyers can actually step back and say, sometimes the more powerful solution for my client is not to make legal this relationship. Yeah, because there's a documenting element of that. I read that Harvard Business Review article and it made complete sense, especially for people who are on the cutting edge of things. It's almost in a way like creating a blueprint and removing that ambiguity. You mentioned some of those three big concepts in that ownership engineering. You talked about leaning into ambiguity, foregoing ownership completely, and then tolerating theft. And I think what's so interesting about all of the work that you've done here is that so much of it does come back to savvy businesses. When we're on that air line and we're sitting in the seat and we're sure that our way is right. It is so easy to get frustrated with the person either in front of you or behind you, but really it is the airline saying, well, this is a way that we can make money off of the same thing and let passengers duke it out and really have the issue with one another. So you talk about businesses shaping who owns what. That's very much the, what we try to teach our law students. And it's really an important message for us to lawyers is to sort of expand the notion of your role of what it means to be a lawyer serving a client in the ownership space. Let me give you an example about HBO, which is also another company very much at the cutting edge of ownership design. When we ask our law students, do any of you illegally stream HBO shows? Most of them raise their hands. How many of you know this is illegal? Very, maybe half the students. It's completely illegal to stream HBO shows using somebody else's password. It's actually a crime punishable by up to a year in prison. But everyone does it. And the thing is, HBO knows that you do it. Not only do they know that you do it, HBO actually encourages theft of their passwords. And they do it because they use theft of their passwords as a way to grow their customer base. In the words of their president and CEO, Richard Plepler, what they're trying to do is build video addicts, they're trying to create buzz for the shows. So HBO could easily, technically, uh, technologically, find all the people who are stealing their content. They choose not to do so. They choose not to do so because they are using another of the most powerful strategies of ownership engineering, what Jim and I call tolerating theft. Tolerating theft turns out to be often more valuable than strictly enforcing your intellectual property rights. We also see this, for example, with Disney. Disney historically was the most aggressive company out there at defending its intellectual property. It sued every daycare that painted an illegal Mickey Mouse on the walls. But in recent years, Disney also realized that tolerating theft was a more powerful legal strategy not relying on the law, actually was profitable for them. And one example of that, a young woman named Bibbidi Bobbidi Brook, she's a super fan of Disney and has an online pirate website where she came up with a new Mickey Mouse ear, a rose colored sequin to Mickey Mouse ear that was a huge hit on her pirate site. Disney could have shut her down and they chose not to. Instead, what they did is they said, hey, we're gonna copy what Bibbidi is doing and put it on the official Disney merchandising sites where it was a huge hit where those Mickey Mouse ears sold out. So Disney now tolerates theft by super fan pirate websites as a cheap form of crowdsourced product R&D. So one of Jim and my main messages is that law 
often is overrated. And the savviest lawyers are lawyers who realize that ownership design includes tools like strategic ambiguity and tolerating theft. We've talked a lot about this, how this comes at these higher levels of things with lawsuits or interaction between different companies and how they choose to handle issues of ownership. Do you have any advice for consumers living in this society where there are all these different interpretations of ownership? And maybe it's just that the media is promoting more of it, but it feels like more and more conflicts over these types of issues as well. One of the interesting things in writing this book is we realized that we really are sort of at an epical transition in how we think about stuff in the sense that historically, like for thousands of years, when you said you owned something, the assumption was it was some thing. It was tangible, it was physical, it was a horse, it was a horseshoe, it was a fence. Nowadays, much of what we own is actually a stream of ones and zeros. So, you know, I've got this iPhone here. What I really own essentially is a plastic brick. What drives the iPhone is the operating system, is the data. I don't own any of that. And yet we have these hardwired, deep, instinctual feelings that if we own it, it's ours. And there was a very interesting poll that was done, or a survey that was done at University of Pennsylvania, where 85% of people believed that when they bought something online, and I mean something you know, like an iBook or an iTunes or something like that, that they fully owned it just like they owned the book or they yeah. owned the album. And that's just not true. Apple can take back their iTunes, Amazon has taken back books. Uh, ironically, one of the books they took back was 1984, which is just the kind of thing Big Brother would do <laughs> yeah. in Orwell's novel. And so there is this disconnect. The phrase that you know is often used in this space is you bought it, but you don't own it. And so for the lawyers listening, you may remember the metaphor of the bundle of sticks when you study property. And the fact is that when we buy these things, we're essentially buying a revocable license. Most of the sticks are actually being retained by Amazon by Apple, by the other content producers. And that's moving in a certain direction. We're buying more and more, we're owning, we're owning less and less. That has some really big consequences for us as consumers, which is what you were asking about. Because Amazon and Apple are such savvy ownership engineers, what they are doing is they are taking advantage of, they're relying on our instinct about ownership. Possession is nine tenths of the law. They're relying on that instinct to basically design the buying experience online, you have a little shopping cart that looks like a real shopping cart. You have the buy now button that feels like you're buying something, but that buy now button doesn't mean what you think it means. And possession online is not nine tenths of the law. It's much more like one tenth of the law. And what that means for us as consumers is that there's a real gap between what we feel like we own, that instinctive notion of possession that comes from our primitive animal background that instinctive notion, and the reality of what we own, what we actually own, which is different and less. And then what that means in practice is that each of us pays Amazon and Apple an extra amount, an extra profit, an unearned premium on every single download. That turns out to be very savvy ownership engineering at the cutting edge as we transition to this world of owning ones and zeros. One of the ways that I've kind of seen the legal industry change a little bit, you know, there's often been this push pull against places where you can do templated work and sort of productize legal services. So a big one that comes up a lot of times is, you know, the difference between hiring an estate planning lawyer to do your will and, and your trust versus using online forms or companies that make it easier. But I've seen more and more lawyers leaning into developing their own productized services and maybe to an extent tolerating some of that theft by selling things like templates for entrepreneurs or th contracts for freelancers or different things like that, that make it, maybe it's an, an ebook that's a PDF download on how to file for a patent or a trademark. Do you see that market changing at all? Is that sort of indicative of all of the other things we've kind of chatted about today? I think we'll see more of that market. One of the things that we talk about in the book is this notion of first mover advantage. Think about for a moment, coaches. Coaches don't have intellectual property protections for the pistol offense. Fashion designers actually can't copyright their fashion designs. And yet these are vibrant, dynamic, competitive markets. And I think that what you're getting at is that lawyers can basically take a page from the same playbook. So if a lawyer wants to make a name for himself or for herself in a particular area, get it out there. And don't worry about being copied later, because if you're first, people are going to come to you and you're going to build a reputation and a brand. Because the key point here is that protecting these things there are transaction costs in doing that. In many sectors, that's not what, what's important. What's important is they know Laura Briggs Esquire is a leading thinker on how to do streamlined estate planning or, or whatever. 
In other words, instead of focusing on ownership and protection of your intellectual property, think instead about branding and marketing and just getting this out there. This is basically the legal equivalent of Uber. So you're talking about basically Uberizing your trust plan. And Uber, when it started, it was operating in a legal vacuum and it wasn't claiming ownership. What it was doing was moving, I mean, it was basically moving ahead of the law. And I think the, you know, many of the savviest lawyers at the cutting edge will also be putting a lot of content out there in ways that are valuable for consumers, allowing them access to, for example, use the estate plan example without having to sort of route that initially through a lawyer. But as people have more complicated estate plans, that they may well turn to the people that they trust because they've given them the sort of initial startup package that gets them on that route to estate planning or incorporating or, or whatever the particular uh, particular pieces. So I see this very much as of a piece with and consistent with sort of the cutting edge of many different industries as we move to sort of a more personal branding approach rather than sort of a bespoke, more expensive one. That's very interesting. Well, thank you both so much for coming on the show. Where can people go to learn a little bit more about your work? I know the book is out if you want to mention that again, but if there's other places you'd like our listeners to check out. Well, for sure. So the book is a fun read. We actually meant it as people who like books like Freakonomics or Tipping Point or Nudge. Basically, it's a great, fun beach read. It's a great gift uh, as we move it into the summer. We hope you buy it at your local independent bookstore. It's in all bookstores. I mean, you should order it from them if they don't have it already in stock. If it's not there, it's on all the uh, major online venues. You can get it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Jim and I have put a lot of work into a website, www.mindthebook.com, mindthebook.com. And very much in keeping with what we were just talking about a minute ago, we've put a tremendous amount of free content on the website. We have videos. We have a super cool quiz that ran in Worth magazine, big excerpts from the book that you can download and read for free. What we want you to do is get the ideas out there, and then you'll see that ownership really is something that's accessible to each of us in a way that is fun and important and exciting. Check it out. All right. Thank you both. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced by Bailey Tiller and edited by Ryan Croft. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discussed here into your practice? Wondering what to do next? Here are your first two steps. First, if you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free at lawyerist.com book. Looking for help beyond the book? Let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyerist.com slash community slash lab to schedule a 15-minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by the participants are their own and not endorsed by the Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.